In this video, we'll be talking about the complex student learning profiles that we see most often at Made for Math and how they impact mathematics. Let's start out with dyslexia. Dyslexia is a neurodevelopmental condition that affects a student's ability to read, write, and spell. We often see language deficits like struggling to find the right word, understanding vocabulary, and reading word problems. To support a student with dyslexia in mathematics, we recommend using explicit instruction. Teach students vocab instruction which involves morphology, as in learning the meaning of word parts. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, head over to YouTube and look at our vocabulary videos. Use graphic organizers along with explicit language and practice using those vocabulary words you're, you're learning. We also recommend rhythm and music. These students like to move and are often quick to pick up rhythm or music. Use similar wording each time you do an activity, such as, how many groups of five can I make out of 20? Counting can be a struggle for these students as well. Use a bean bag to help students get the rhythm of counting forward and backward, as well as skip counting. We also like to use gross motor. Help students tie what they're learning by getting the whole body involved. Simultaneously tie the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic to the math you're working on. And lastly, word problem instruction. With word problems, begin helping students to visualize what's happening. Reveal one sentence at a time and write or draw simple diagrams of what's happening. Pause at the punctuation marks and then encourage students to predict what the question might be. Then introduce students to schema-based instruction such as comps. This helps students build upon those earlier skills and tying it to algebraic thinking. When we work with students that have dyslexia, instead of struggling to find the right words, we see students struggle to recall their math facts. Not being able to recall math facts does not necessarily equate to being bad at math. To support a student that's struggling with math facts, we recommend simultaneous processing with that CRA instruction. This type of instruction allows students to map the supertized quantity onto the numerals and mathematical symbols through building and drawing. Make sure to have students touch and say, or write and say what they're doing to build that internal dialogue. An example of this is analyzing what 243 is made of. Two hundreds, four tens, and three ones. The student touches and says the quantities and then tells us the name of the quantity, 243. We also suggest selected facts. We want to narrow down which math facts are being used in sessions. Choose two to three new math facts and related operations plus previously mastered facts. Use representations that will be easily retrievable if word or fact retrieval fails. And then games. To build math fact fluency, timing and retrieval activities are good for memory. But so many of our kids have been burned by timing done poorly in the classroom or at home with flashcards or even in the mad minute. Games can lower the stakes and add interest. Plus, games make math fact instruction feel relevant and interesting. However, games should still be tailored to focus facts and need to move quickly. It's not uncommon to see a student with dyslexia working slowly. This is due to weakened rapid automatic naming, or RAN, and their working memory is struggling to hold information and work with it. To support a student with slow working speed, do the following. Provide shortened assignments. Reduced speeds on rapid automatic naming can slow dyslexic students down. Shorten the assignments, that would be best. You could opt for extra time, but that can be overwhelming when a student who already has to work harder has to work even longer. Give students what we call near point references. A near point reference can be a physical manipulative or even a graphic organizer. These help reduce load on working memory and prompt recall. And please limit teacher talk. Don't interrupt the students with additional information or chit chat as they think and solve. Again, you are reducing load on working memory when you chat. Not sure what to do with all that quiet? Take a drink or get some chapstick on those lips. 
We also want to highlight some of the strengths with dyslexia. We see students have strong skills in the visual. We want to help them build an internal number line using supertized representations in that CRE instruction can help students use those visual strengths to retrieve not just the answer or a fact, but visual and numerical understanding. Many of them often have good math reasoning. Guide students to use that strength to go back and evaluate the answer to catch mistakes that may have come from a word retrieval difficulty. Remember that good mathematicians don't get everything perfect. Good mathematicians still make mistakes, but they also check their work. Another profile that can significantly impact a student is dyscalculia. There's often levels of severity as well. Typically, we see students struggling with one-to-one -one correspondence and understanding quantity along with the written symbol. For example, a person with this learning profile has no sense of how many bowls and spoons to get out for family dinner. Many of the same remediation strategies we suggest for a dyslexic student are appropriate, but for opposite reasons. Dyslexic students have language deficits that cause them to have difficulty mapping language to quantity, whereas a dyscalculic student may have stronger language skills overall, but have difficulty with math language because they don't understand the quantities and the mathematical symbols. To assist these students, we recommend that simultaneous processing with the CRE instruction. So just like with dyslexia, build and draw to map the supertized quantity onto numerals and mathematical symbols. Touch and say, but be even more explicit with beginning number composition, place value, number lines, and focus on smaller increments of new information with extra practice of each skill before moving on because you are building the understanding of quantity. So for example, you may need to spend time practicing all the ways to compose and represent numbers that are four or less because these students may not have the ability to supertize even these small quantities. To help with this, refer to our Math Facts to Memory Volume 1 book. Another great adjustment are those selected facts. Choose two to three new facts and related operations, plus those previously mastered ones again using representations to help build the understanding of quantity and games of course remember that the goal of a game is to practice the skills and strategies in a low stake environment keep the game short and focus with those select facts and skills similar to dyslexia we see students with slow working speed due to their lack of numeracy processing speed and working memory and extensive gaps in semantic knowledge Watching these students process can feel as slow as dial-up and as severe as communicating through Morse code. Again, give shortened assignments and those near point references. They help reduce the load on working memory and teacher talk. Make sure you're limiting it. Again, we want to reduce the load on things that are coming into the working memory. Provide processing pauses for these students. Research studies seeking to find strengths tied to dyscalculia have failed, possibly partly due to broad definitions of dyscalculia. This doesn't mean our students don't have strengths, but that there isn't any specific strength that usually comes with dyscalculia. Our students are all different, and many of their strengths develop over time. If you've got a student that seems to be struggling significantly, could it be dyslexia or dyscalculia? Or is it possibly both? If a student has both, you'll see stronger deficits in semantics, the how the numbers work, and mental representations of numbers. You'll want to spend more time with the concrete and explicit instruction and make sure that you give tons of think time without that teacher talk. This is crucial. Let's talk about attentional issues and executive functioning. This is referring to a student's ability to sustain attention and store information in a way that is accessible to them again in the future. All learning begins with attention. It is processed through the amygdala and then is held in working memory. If the attention is not focused on the math concepts and vocabulary, 
then the information won't even encode into the brain for future retrieval. To assist with attention and memory, we recommend simultaneous processing with CRA. Is there a catching on with the pattern? It's really important for us to subitize and to build and draw so that students can map these things onto numerals, touching and saying, writing and saying. You can also help by cutting the clutter. Limit the things that can distract on the page, in the room, and in your instructional language. With your manipulatives, pay extra attention to using them in a clear and focused way. Don't fall into the trap of allowing them to become an inefficient calculator. Put any manipulatives away that are not being used. Also, make sure to show students directly how to use these ma manipulatives. And if needed, set aside one to two minutes at the end to build with and play as a reward. Only use digital manipulatives if physical ones are just not working with your student. Research shows that even though physical or digital manipulatives work equally well for learning, physical manipulatives lead to better retention over time, especially in our students with math difficulties. When you're creating a paper with homework or working on a whiteboard, make sure to have four or fewer problems per page. It's clutter free, there's limited graphics, and the font is easy to read. There needs to be ample white space and large font. We're talking 16 point font or bigger. And use large grid paper. And these strategies can help with dysgraphia too. You'll also wanna keep the workspace clutter free. Students need a clear space without distraction. Consider using headphones. And teacher's workspace also needs to be clutter free and think about what students can see behind you. Cut the clutter in your teacher talk and in instructional language. Make it clear and focused, and again, silent work periods. Also, limit flipping through applications. When you are using a shared document camera and a digital whiteboard and digital manipulatives, it can be too much movement between softwares to help sustain attention. For your pacing, use a rapid pace to hold the attention for those fast thinking, impulsive students or use a slow rate of speech for students that have a slower processing speed. This allows them plenty of think time. These students also struggle to plan and organize their thoughts. We need to model these things for our students and scaffold the skills by providing those near point references. Many of our graphic organizers have buttons. These are not just for memory support, but also aids the student in planning and organizing the steps to a problem. Over time, you can teach students to plan and organize when they begin to make their own buttons. Use color coding. This is especially helpful for middle and high school students. Color coding could be coloring yellow and red for integers, or you could even use the chant circles and diamonds and squares. Oh my, circles and diamonds and squares, oh my. This helps you identify different terms in a longer expression or equation and assist in combining them. For our younger students, the chant for multi-digit addition and subtraction can be used. Check the sign, follow the line, and this is where we begin. Make sure to model checking answers. Show students explicitly how to check their work and notice what kinds of errors they're making on a consistent basis then coach them how to watch for those errors. If students have made their own buttons, they can add reminders for common mistakes on their own page. People with ADHD are often creative and enthusiastic. They're gifted at communication and at avoiding work. Often, our students keep us thoroughly amazed and entertained. A student with autism approaches mathematics in their own interesting way. Students with autism can be rigid in their approaches and struggle to generalize information or solving in new ways. To support a student, we want to use what? CRE instruction. Are you noticing this pattern? CRE instruction is beneficial to all students, but essential for many students for a variety of reasons. It's the basis of good instruction. 
During CRE instruction, teachers can help students generalize how algorithms can help us solve many different representations of the same operation. So for example, the student who didn't know that five could mean five fingers, five on a die, or five tallies, or five jumps on a number line, or how about the student that could solve multiplication when they were playing the bump game, but didn't think they could solve the same problem in a test. These students can be prone to using their pattern recognition strengths to solve algorithms without knowing the meaning behind them. Make sure you're using accurate mathematical language. So for example, we've heard some teachers teach subtraction with regrouping as needing to get a babysitter if you're too little. This kind of language is harmful for all kids, but especially our students with autism. They can take things more literally. The multi-sensory lesson plan used in our CRA instruction provides a structure for our students to know what to expect and feel safe during a lesson. We also want to show students how to generalize. Make sure students are explicitly taught the applications of an algorithm and connected to different representations, story problems, different forms of an algorithm such as vertical or horizontal, different uses and meanings for vocabulary. And also, you want to explain the why. Explain the benefits of using different methods. These students may want to keep solving in a certain way with certain manipulatives and see no reason to switch to representational or an algorithm. So you need to explicitly explain the purpose for doing so. You might see a student with autism that struggles with sensory information. Either they are seeking a sensory experience or they're avoiding one. Some students may detest working with clay to the feeling on their skin. They also can struggle with filtering out noise and focusing on the person speaking. To support a student with sensory processing needs such as these, allow students to have more choice in what manipulatives they use. You may need to sub them out for different textures. Think about our Unifix cubes, they're smooth. And maybe you need to switch them out to something with more texture or vice versa. Allow students to use gloves when they're working with that clay. Those who seek sensory input will often really enjoy using our manipulatives. You could also provide a student with headphones or an earbuds. This helps with the online instruction to keep their attention and filter out extra noise. And bonus tip, those near point visual references can also help these students that have maybe auditory processing issues or verbal reasoning. And lastly, again, cut that clutter. A disorganized experience can be very overwhelming for those who get visually overstimulated. Students with autism are excellent at pattern recognition. Use buttons on your graphic organizers and follow a predictable lesson plan. You could even label your digital whiteboard in the upper right hand corner with what section of the lesson plan you're in. Many of our autistic students have an interest in what they are passionate about. Theming your lessons and games around these areas keeps students engaged and lets them feel more successful when they are working on a topic that's familiar and rewarding to them. Remember, multisensory math is good instruction for all students, but it is essential for the learning profiles we serve here at Made for Math.